so I think um, you all know where we are. We are um, very near Naranjana River. Of course, mm. Bodhi, Mahabodhi, um, big the most important place where after so many from the uh, Mahayana's point of view. Um, so many of, after so many ye uh, eons, finally the Bodhisattva managed to vanquish all the Maras, Maras of Uh, aggregates, maras of emotion, emotions, maras of uh, death, and then maras of the the pride or the um, son of God. <clears throat> But prior to that, it was somewhere here. Probably we could be, we may be sitting on the very spot where Buddha had walked. I imagine there was a lot of forest a lot of wild animals. But um, this used to be also um, a place where farmers lived. And um, we all know, most of us we know that lady Sujata who actually offered rice milk, uh, rice and milk, sort of, um, mm, I think it's a very auspicious uh, Indian food. And this is um, kind of a important significance because Buddha was um, telling us that the path of the extreme is a wrong path that um, <clears throat> the right and the safe path is the, pa the path of the middle way, or the middle path. And um, so 
so from a very sort of you know the Tibetans love to talk about auspicious circumstances and uh, from the auspicious circumstances point of view Sujata and her offering happen to be very um, significant the whole that event became a very important significant teaching if you like and anyway after the enlightenment at the request of the Brahma and the Indra the Buddha began to teach well historically speaking starting from Saranath and then many many myriad places and um, after the Pari Nirvana of the Buddha in a very holy place called Kushinagar disciples of the Buddha began to collect his teachings for the benefit of the future um, students and practitioners and um, due to the, the power of the great Arhats living around that time so many sutras Abhidharma and Vinaya managed, were managed to be remembered and collected in places like the Vulture's Peak I'm sure some of you may have been and then later on these many different set of teachings begin to travel throughout the different continent well I guess beginning with China neighboring Thailand Burma, Sri Lanka, so on and so forth and um, also the Tibetan kings begin to have interest in the Buddha Dharma and put so much, em uh, so much effort in translating the words of the Buddha and once for Tibetans, for us when the, when the teachings of the Buddha arrived and got translated it, it, got ref it, it was referred as it, it's, it's then referred as Kanjur the, <clears throat> the Sutra which has so many many different um, sutras and um, now as many of you know we um, attempting with the aspiration to complete we, we are at least attempting to translate some of these his words into primarily in English at the moment and then of course if uh, circumstance and the situation arise in many different languages <clears throat> 
the teaching of the Buddha <coughs> is um, so relevant, more than ever probably relevant, more now than ever. <coughs> because of its um, emphasis in finding the truth, discovering the truth. the truth of not just matters but the truth of our mind, perception, the world. I've been asked to um, say few, uh, say, and sort of extract from some of these sutras, and um, Chantakirti said that expounding the sutra. One has to be, and I think I have said this before, and some of you may remember this. Um, expounding the sutra is not an easy task to explain the sutra. In fact, you need to be um, a sublime being, S someone who has already reached the first Bhumi, and which is really, basically we are talking about only someone who is not under the tyranny of emotion, habitual passion, ego clinging. Only such person can explain the Sutra. So of course, Obviously, someone like myself has no way to even um, think of uh, explaining. I cannot. I will not say that I will be explaining the sutra. But uh, so, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to sort of introduce to you, and maybe hopefully to the world in uh, the generally people who are interested introduce the in, uh, this amazing words of the wisdom that actually exists within the within these sutras introduce you and at least make some of us realize that there is such a priceless words teachings and the technique that are given by the Shakyamuni Buddha long time ago, and that that is very much within our reach and within something that we can apply immediately without much uh, effort. So. Even though, as I said, Sutra is very difficult to explain, I have um, agreed to go through and extract the, this uh, particular Sutra, which I think we are going to resound tomorrow morning. And this is the Sutra of um, the question of the Maitreya. <coughs> Nobel Mahai, this and I shall point out 
This is a Mahayana Sutra. And um, Sutra is, of course, not only it is very profound and difficult to explain, this is also quite uh, tedious and very long. So there is, under no way, you should think that we can actually go through each stanzas and finish it. I mean, first of all, um, for me to go through each stanzas and explain each point is really difficult. I want to begin with um, I want to begin with um, respond, I mean, uh, an, uh, some sort of um, expression from Ananda. It's a summary in the middle of this sutra. <clears throat> After a lengthy discourse from the Buddha, Ananda, who was so impressed by Maitreya, stood up did prostrations to the Lord and told the Buddha how amazing Maitreya was. And then Buddha said, yes. Buddha Shakyamuni agreed that Maitreya is a really, really amazing, in, it's like uh, inexpressible, the quality, width, and the depth, and the sort of the The quality of the Maitreya is just beyond our ordinary people's reach. And this was actually what I, I'm not telling the telling you the story properly. This was after Shakyamuni Buddha taught quite lengthy teachings, Maitreya actually stood up and praised the Buddha. And Ananda, who was there, was so impressed by the Maitreya's praise to the Buddha. And then as a response to Ananda, Shakyamuni said, in fact, it is not only this time that Maitreya is so incredible. In, in fact, and this is a story Shakyamuni Buddha told to Ananda, in fact, long time ago, um, Maitri, this is like eons L very long time ago, eons of eons and eons ago, one, once Maitreya was a um, householder, no, actually a Brahmin, a Brahmin boy, whose name was, I think, Badri. And he was very handsome, tall, beautiful to look at, and he was very well dressed, elegant, and he was just uh, going for a stroll. 
in a forest. And suddenly the Brahmin boy encounter this great Buddha, the all illuminating Buddha. This is another Buddha we are talking about okay, in the past. The Buddha was so magnificent. Buddha was so beautiful. Buddha attracted so much devotion. Buddha was, this Buddha was uh, a tamer of all the uh, sense and sense object. The Buddha was adorned with a great compassion and calmness. He was also very disciplined. He was like the bull of the man. This is all very Indian way of expressing, so I don't know what are the significance, so I'm just, you know, whatever I know I'm explaining. The Buddha was like a uh, beautiful lake uh, that is not stirred by wind. Buddha, who was adorned with the 32 major marks, 80 minor marks. Buddha, who was like the big sal tree, with the branches and the fruits and the flowers. Buddha who was like a Mount Meru, very majestic and steady and unmoving. Buddha whose face is like a full moon, cool and soothing. Buddha who is like the sun that is so bright and shining and all illuminating. And Buddha, who was like a Nagroda tree. I think Nagroda tree you can actually find even today. I think the quality of the Nagroda tree is supposedly where you don't really see what the width and the breadth. It's some sort of a quality, basically immeasurable. So such kind of the Buddha, the Brahmin encountered as he was walking in the forest, in the garden actually. And then the Brahmin thought, Alala, Tejinshi Bikundi, Namba Tejin, Kato Tejin, Bapada. He thought, Wow, what a handsome and beautiful man I'm encountering, uh, encountering here now. Who is this? This is an amazing man. And he was so moved by the Buddha, he expressed to the Buddha, who was, whom he is now encountering, saying, I also wish to be like you in my future lives. I also wish to be as majestic as you. I also wish to be as glorious as you. I also wish to be adorned with the 32 major marks and 80 minor marks, just like you. I wish to be all illuminating like you. And out of strong devotion, the Brahmin boy just fell on the ground. And, <clears throat> and as he fell on the ground, the Buddha is coming towards him, okay? As he fell on the ground, he thought, the Brahmin Buddha is thinking this, I really want to be as majestic as this man. I really want to be as glorious as this man. I want to be all illuminating as this man. For that, probably, as this Buddha is, as this guy is walking towards me, probably his feet might touch me. And upon touching my body, it may actually make me like him. This is what he thought. And as a, some sort of a deliberate sort of, um, he was trying to set up for being touched by the, the Buddha. So he, f he basically lied down on the, on the road, on the path. And then at that time, the Buddha, the all illuminating Buddha, of course, being an omniscient, he knew what the Brahmin boy was thinking. And as Buddha walked, he, Buddha slightly touched 
his body. And at that very point, and this is the beautiful thing that this sutra says, at that very moment, they say, Michi Vichuru, At that very moment, the Brahmin boy achieved something, achieved something incredible blessing. And do you know what that blessing is? It's called Michi Vichuru, Zopatoba. He attained the courage and the patience to hear emptiness. Can you tell the, can you see there's this, this amazing sort of setup here? Here's this beautiful forest, this nice looking Brahmin boy walking. He's himself a very nice looking man. And then he sees this um, amazing looking man coming towards him. He had so much devotion, he wanted to sort of like, almost like, uh, trap the Buddha, sort of make, force him to give him the blessing. So he lies down and he gets, uh, he get, uh, you know, the Buddha touch his uh, body. And then what does he get? He gets the highest blessing. And this blessing, the highest blessing is Mishibhichara Zabhatava. The blessing so that you will never, actually to really express this properly, it is a blessing it's a blessing upon receiving, you will not shudder when you, when you hear the shunyata, emptiness, when you will not, you will not sh shudder, you will not, you will not um, you, you will not be scared, you will not be afraid upon hearing the Shunyata. That was the blessing he received. It's amazing, isn't it? It's a worthy of some flute. Can you play flute? <laughs> just a little bit, short one. And imagine the, all the, everything what I just said as he says, he plays the flute.
I needed time to read this also. So. <laughs> and then, this Buddha, the all illuminating Buddha, after that, all, Ill all illuminating Buddha told his attendants, there were also other monks and arhats walking with him. And he, the Buddha, told the arhats and the monks, hey, you guys, don't step over him. Because this boy is still, you know, lying down there. You guys cannot step over him. You guys dare, you, sh you, ca you, you, know, you should not, you dare not touch this, this boy or uh, step over him. Why? Because this boy, this man, has now gain this fearlessness of hearing the shunyata, which you monks and the arhats, you guys don't have. You are still very much afraid of the mahashunyata, whereas this boy has no more fear. So you, your feet are not worthy to touch his body. Anyway, after lengthy, and then Shakya, Shakyamuni, now we are going back to Shakyamuni. Shakyamuni Buddha told Ananda, and do you know who is that boy? That boy is no other than Maitreya in his past lives. Then, my, okay, Ananda thought, okay. Why? Okay, <clears throat> then Mananda said, you know, I'm hearing all this greatness of Maitreya in his past life and this present life. And why is he then still not enlightened? You know, Maitreya is still a Bodhisattva waiting to be enlightened. He's, he's the next one, by the way, here. Why is he not enlightened yet? Now, this is a really important that you need to hear. Shakyamuni Buddha said that there's something so important and this is, the, this is really good. This is something that someone like me, I need to hear this. Shakyamuni Buddha said to Ananda, in fact, Maitreya took the bodhicitta vow 42 eons before me, before Shakyamuni Buddha, even 42 eons before. And the Ananda was so surprised. 42 eons before you and he is still not yet enlightened, he is behind you? Why is that? Then Buddha gave a lengthy explanations on why. Because Shakyamuni Buddha himself, he said, I was a very, very diligent and I was a very, very, what do you call it? Mm. There's a lot of perseverance and I was really, like I would give my eyes, I would give my limbs, and I would basically, um, uh, what do you call it, sacrifice my own body, my own children, my own uh, uh, family, my own kingdom, so on and so forth. Basically, the Shakyamuni Buddha's his own um, path was um, uh, what do you call it? A um, uh, lot of uh, endurance and lot of um, hardship. Whereas now this is something that Maitreya for the benefit of all sentient beings, benefit of many other sentient beings, he took another way, and that is the way of prayers. Not too much of sacrificing, <laughs> not too much of, you know, like, you know, um, uh, like giving your own blood, giving on your own 
what do you call it, limbs, you're giving your own, you know, not too much hardship. That's why, even though 42 eons before Maitreya actually took the Bodhicitta vow, he is not yet enlightened. And this, these are the sort of the teachings that we hear quite a lot in the sutras, which is sort of, in a way, you may hear it as a, you may hear as a criticism, but this is a praise. Because not everybody, and this really includes you and me, definitely me, I, for one, I cannot take this hardship. I will not give my eyes. You know, they, in the sutra, there is the lengthy explanations on how Buddha, in his previous life, he gave up his own eyes to a blind person, so on and so forth. I, I can't do that. And Shakyamuni Buddha's point is that a Maitreya's path is so blissful, le uh, um, lack of, I mean, so blissful, uh, peaceful, um, no hardship, and then, especially, Maitreya uh, achieved so many of the, these great enlightened qualities through the prayer of the Maitreya, which is actually within the Sutra. So this is something that I wanted to tell you first. Okay, now, the Sutra itself, Arya Maitreya Pari Pritsa Nama Mahayana Sutra, Once upon a time, when uh, again this this was um, collected by the great Mahasanga, especially by Ananda, later after the Buddha pa passing into the Parinirvana, um, when uh, Buddha was dwelling in this. Um, Mount Susumara, I think it's called Mount Susumara, very fearsome mountain, with so many entourage disciples, such as um, 500 um, big shoes, those, those who are all um, Sublime beings such as um, Kodiyana, uh, Mahanama, Mahabhadri, and um, Kashyapa, so many, many great. Uh, there's a long list of names of. Um, what is it? Um, the big shoes and also arhats. Then there was also um, many other disciples of from the Mah uh, Mahayana, <coughs> the, such as um, Avalokiteshvara, such as. Uh, Manjushri. Uh, Shidi Garba, Akasha Garba, so on and so forth. Many Mahayana and Bodhisattva, Mahabodhisattvas, surrounded by these great beings. One um, Buddha was um, dwelling. Buddha was in the Mount Sumasuru, no, Sus, uh, Susumara, Susumara. And um, at that time, the great Bodhisattva, Mahabodhisattva, Maitreya was also there. And at one point, 
Maitreya stood up and kneeling down in front of the Buddha asked Tathagata that he has few questions or he, he needs some clarification. And as Maitreya was given the permission to ask the question, this was what Maitreya asked. How many, with how many attributes or discipline can a bodhisattva abandon all the samsara or the lower birth lower rebirth or and with how many attributes or the technique can a bodhisattva not be outshined or influenced by non-virtuous friend and with how many attributes or the technique or the discipline can the bodhisattva swiftly achieve Mahapari Nirvana or the um, enlightenment. So there's a three elements in this question. One is how to escape from the samsara and how to not be influenced by the non-virtuous friend or a non-virtuous influence, and how to achieve the enlightenment quick. Upon asking this question, Buddha was very pleased, Tathagata was very pleased, and even praised the Maitreya, saying that you, Maitreya, you have gathered so much virtue in the past. You have, you, have, you have remembered so many of your past lives. You have gained fearlessness quality. You have maintained being the brahmacharya for so many <coughs> lifetimes. You have also benefited so many sentient beings, giving them bliss, giving them kindness, compassion. You have also fulfilled the wishes of the gods and human. And you have so much aspiration to uphold and maintain the Bodhisattva Yana path for the sake of all the um, noble children of the of the Buddha for now and for the future. So therefore, I shall answer you. I shall give you a detailed answer to this question. Um, keep it in your heart. Uh, listen and keep it in your heart. So this is how the sutra begins. And as I said early, right at the beginning, there is no way that I can actually cover all the answer because it comes in many, many different set. Like, um, I, I guess we will just um, dwell uh, on the first answer uh, for today and then see uh, where this leads us. This is what Buddha said. 
Chamba, Chanchus and Pachu, Chigdan, then and Yasuntam, the Ponging, the Bitro, with Ladu Mendo, the New Lana, my Bayanta, but the Vichin, the Numbers of Sanja, the Church, Kanshan, and Didate, Hog with Samba, Pinsum, so be Chanjus and the Chamba Chanjus and the Church, but then and Yasuntam, the Ponging, the Bitro, with Ladu Mendo, the New Lana, my Bayanta, but the Vichin, the Numbers of Sanja, with just one attribute, with just one discipline, with just one practice. A bodhisattva can um, renounce or free themselves from all the trapping and uh, bondage of the samsara. With just one attribute or the discipline, a bodhisattva can um, be free from the negative influence of the non-virtuous friend. And with just one discipline, a bodhisattva will free, I mean, a bodhisattva will achieve uh, enlightenment quickly. And that is okay, first, that is bodhicitta. But it is defined in this sutra as a hlap is samba pinsun sabe chanju jisem, which is um, a bodhicitta with an extraordinary vision. Now, this is where I have to interpret. I, uh, you know, this is like, as I said, you know, this is totally my interpretation. So, uh, please. Uh, make note that this may not be and uh, not necessarily be correct, but um, relying on some other shastras, commentaries, I'm uh, interpreting that when he talks about this bodhicitta, his own, his, and when he define with the word lakvisambha, the extraordinary vision or the extraordinary um, Yes, I think the vision is the right word. He's talking about the relative bodhicitta and the ultimate bodhicitta together. So, only with the bodhicitta, all bodhisattva need is just one thing, and that is the bodhicitta. The bodhicitta with a grand vision. Now, since this is the most important part of the Sutra, and even though you, many of you have heard the Bodhicitta in the past, since this is a very um, holy, imp important and special environment, I shall explain a little bit about Bodhicitta. As it is stated in the word Lhakvisambha, Bodhicitta is really it's a grand plan, it's a grand project, it's a grand vision. You, I could easily say there's no grander, no bigger vision than this. This is much more grander than building a nation, making a, you know, some sort of a um, grand plan to uh, save the world from pollution, um, grand vision of uh, saving the environment, um, saving the mankind. We are talking about much more than that. We are talking about grand vision to enlighten all sentient beings, grand vision to make all sentient beings to understand the truth grand vision to liberate all sentient beings from getting distracted to all kinds of distractions. And we are talking about doing this single-handedly. So, and this is something we need to especially the younger bodhisattva need to know 
is uh, when we talk when we talk about this kind of grand vision sometimes it becomes abstract sometimes it become you know you may end up thinking this is just a wishful thinking i mean if we can't achieve a world peace peace on this earth how can we even imagine to enlighten all sentient beings this is like beyond your own reach beyond your capacity this is how you may think but the mahayana people and this is what this sutra is saying having this kind of you know cowardness this kind of uh, what do you call it i will not be able to do this is like the fundamental laziness and the fundamental sort of a self abuse i'm i'm getting this from the some of the not the commentary of this but commentary to other bodhicitta words so i'm just adding this here like this is really not trusting your own capacity of grand vision and there's many ways to look into this one is this is also a mind training by the way and i think it makes sense because for instance this is what i've just said early, just few days ago to uh, the teachings there if if you are doing a business a commercial business if you have a grand plan like a really a big plan then you know you can actually maybe go through some hardship of losing few millions and you would not really give too much you will not stressed out too much because you have a much grand vision uh, losing here and there a little bit of you know a few millions here a few limbs here a few blood here is expected so to speak because you have a much grander vision if you have a very small narrow limited vision such as praveen and me sitting here who only ha has the wish to open one pawn shop <laughs> then when that doesn't happen when few hundred rupees are lost we sort of um, we whine and we brood and we have big fights with <laughs> among ourselves because of the lack of vision and the grand plan so i think in the ears of those who are selfish self oriented self cherishing i think words like enlightening all sentient beings we are talking about everyone including the new president of united states <laughs> we are not excluding him of course not we, we are wish we are really not only wishing we are not only planning we are actually actually beginning and doing something about it we are actually beginning we are actually already applying the ac action to enlighten all sentient beings how even through a this is why i was telling the story first like the maitreya through the prayers P prayers and that's already in action you should not sort of look down at aspiration you should not look down at what do you call it just uh, good wishes because wish strong wish is what makes uh, something uh, what do you call it uh, so uh, powerful so i'm assuming that this is what uh, buddha meant when he talked about extraordinary visionary bodhicitta is the one thing that will save that will free that 
we make the bodhisattva abandon all the samsaric trappings. And it makes sense because you know, why do we fall into the traps of the samsara? Because we have such a limited vision, we have such a narrow vision, we have such a small plan. So when, and it's usually self-centered, it's usually um, something to do with our own cocoon and our own, what do you call it, comfort zone. We just do not go beyond that. So that's why we become the victim of all the samsaric, um, samsaric uh, cause and the result. Now, the th second element, how, d how does the, again, if you have the grand vision, how can you be influenced by the non-virtuous friend? What do we mean by non-virtuous friend? Non-virtuous are those who have a small plan, those who have a very short, small, narrow-minded, only who think about a pawn shop. You understand? You know, if you are going to like Wall Street meetings, you know, those who really are doing a big deal business, if people like Pravin and me go there and talk about a pawn shop, they will kick us out. We are a hindrance. <laughs> Likewise, if the small vision people, narrow-minded, small, you know, you, those who only think about themselves, those who only think about their own comfort, those who only think about tomorrow, probably day after tomorrow, probably next month, probably next year, that's it. That's all they can think of. That's, that's the limit of their grand vision, next year or maybe after a few years. But they don't go beyond that. Those are non-virtuous. Now, if you adapt yourself, if you learn to be, learn to be this amazing grand visionary, you cannot be influenced by them. So you are free from these. And then, with this grand vision, with this, you know, being free, because when we talk about grand vision, now as you know, we are not talking about clinging to the self, we are not talking about the cherishing of the self, we are not, we are really, really, see right now, our plan only, it just never goes outside of the parameter called me. You understand? There's a parameter, there's a boundary called me, mine. That's it. That's all our plan revolves around, around there. But as soon as you think about beyond that, then you are already free from this chain this boundary, this small bondage of self-clinging. And, and, this, and this is why only through the extraordinary grand vision you can quickly achieve the body nirvana, the nirvana. So this is sort of the beginning of today's, um, what do you call it, um, Maitriya Sutra, and I will try to continue a little bit tomorrow, but before we um, qu slowly walk out, let, let us listen to this amazing flute again.
Thank you.